Old Times of Southern New Jersey. This is Far Out Radio. I'm Scott Teeters, and today is Wednesday. It's September the 25th, 2013, and that means it's three months to Christmas. I, stop that groaning. Stop that right now. <laughs> Just kidding you. We have a new guest this evening to introduce to you here on Far Out Radio. Frank Joseph is the former editor of Ancient American Magazine. He was the editor from 1993 to 2009. Frank has authored 20 books about prehistory with titles including the Atlantis Encyclopedia, Opening uh, opening the Ark of the Covenant, and Unearthing Ancient America. Frank is a frequent guest speaker at various metaphysical and archaeological societies in the U.S. and abroad. He's with us this evening to talk about his latest book, an enormous undertaking titled Before Atlantis, 20 Million Years of Human and Pre-Human Cultures. You know, in an age where it's difficult enough to keep recent history straight, it's hard to fathom being able to sort out pre-Atlantis history. So, But this will be a mind-bending evening, so get out your pad and your pen and take notes. Frank's book, Before Atlantis, is published by Bear and & Company and is available at Amazon.com in print and in Kindle formats. Hi, Frank. Welcome to the program. Hello, Scott. Thanks for the opportunity. Of course. If, you know, I was going through your book today and I, I was struck by so many things. I have a lot of notes here and a lot of questions for you. But uh, if history uh, was uh, taught like this in, in history classes in school, um, we all probably would have paid a lot more attention. Because <laughs> oh, this well, is that's, just that's the about biggest the, the nicest story. Thing that, that, that's about the nicest thing anybody could say about uh, my work. I, I re- deeply appreciate that. And um, If I can just connect with one reader the way... I have with you, then the book's a success. So thank you very much for sharing that with me. Well, you're quite welcome. And it's just the biggest story. I mean, you know, coming to this, I'm I'm a, look, I'll admit to you, I'm a, I'm a student and someone who's just very interested that's, you know, mainly just likes to listen to guys like you uh, to talk about these things. And for many, many, many years, you know, uh, I, I've heard people talk about Atlantis and read things about Atlantis, and it's one of those topics that's like way back there, or at least that's what it seems like in my mind, uh, way, way back there. And your book is talking about pre-Atlantis, and you just, you know, your mind starts to go on tilt. So anyway, before we get into the uh, into your book, uh, tell us about your background and how it is that you got into this Amazon-like river of interest. So how did this all start for you, Frank? Uh, well, I, I can tell you, Scott, that uh, was just uh, a very long time. We were talking about before Atlanta. That seems like before Atlanta so long ago when I was at school. I was at uh, Southern Illinois University back in the 1960s. And I was a, an ordinary student just like anybody else. And I've had an interest, perhaps, in history and archaeology a little bit more, but beyond that, really, I did I don't think I was. I certainly was not an outstanding student in any particular way. But uh, one day, uh, I was taking a kind of a little weekend vacation, going to St. Louis, Missouri, which is about an hour and a half away from the university. And on the way there, um, I had a little side trip. I got off the expressway, and there was a, a brown sign there saying uh, Cahokia Mound. Well, I assume they were just some little Indian burial mounds. I thought it might be kind of interesting to check out that thought all. And instead, when I got off the exit there in Collinsville in southern mm-hmm. Illinois, just across the Mississippi River from St. Louis, I was confronted by this gigantic pyramid. It's broader at its base than the Great Pyramid of Egypt. It's over 100 feet high. It had all kinds of astronomical orientations. It's obviously, the layout and the construction of this thing was immense over 130 million cubic yards of soil that was landscaped into this magnificent step pyramid. And I had never heard of such a thing it's called Monk's Mount. It was made about 1,100 years ago by a totally unknown people. I was shocked. I had never heard of anything like this. When I went back to the university, I sort of grabbed my teacher by the caller and I said, how come you never have discussed this with any of us and here it's only about an hour and a half away? And he said, uh, well, it's not as significant as you may think. It's not as significant really? as I may think. Well, isn't this a little important, a pyramid which is bigger at its base than the Great Pyramid of Egypt and 
similar to it in many regards, astronomically aligned. So that was the first time that I began to think out of the box a little bit. I think like my education is woefully deficient, and it was never addressed by the by the way. We were told, and we're still told, the textbook history of America is that nothing really of any significance happened here before 1492. That the first human beings that appeared in the Americas showed up maybe 10, 11, 12,000 years ago. They straggled across a land bridge from Siberia. Well, I found that all that information is not outdated. It's totally erroneous. It's completely wrong. And that's what I've spent the last, well, 50 years now almost examining this problem. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why Americans are are so befuddled about their own history and what happens to our country. We don't know what's going on. We reel from one catastrophe to the next, don't know what's happening. And I think the reason for that is is that our own our own past, our own national history is so completely distorted and history and even archaeology is just nothing more than politics. And I've tried to diffuse the politics in my books. I want I only want to know what really happened. I want to know the truth. I'm not concerned about anybody's political agendas and nobody's opinions or theories, least of all my own. I never begin my books with a theory, never. When I begin writing about something, I'm in almost total ignorance. I know almost nothing about what I'm writing about. And then I collect evidence. And sometimes it'll take me many years, maybe a decade or more, to collect the necessary evidence. And only after the evidence has been collected and organized does a kind of a conclusion begin to emerge. That's the way I do it. I, I start off with the evidence first, not the theory. Let the theory arise from what the facts are. And our education, our educational system is the exact opposite of that. The theory is stated to some kind of scientific doctrine or dogma, mm-hmm. and all the facts are made to try to fit this theory. I don't. I work totally backwards from that. So that's how that's how I got into it. Really, was my own education. I thought there was something wrong with it. Now I'm absolutely sure there there was and is. So you don't think that the pyramids were built with slave labor and ropes and ramps and logs rolling those big blocks up those ramps? I don't think that any of the pyramids, either those in the ancient old world or in the new world, were built that way. Instead, these structures were great inspirations for the societies from which these things arose. Far from being enslaved to make these things, people considered as a high honor to participate in the creation of these truly sacred works. They're not monuments to the megalomania of a single king or pharaoh who wants to use it as a personal mausoleum. That's not the case. None of them were. You know, that's the interesting thing about the, the pyramids in Egypt. There's about 100 pyramids that are known in ancient, that are associated with ancient Egypt. And there's not been a human burial in one of them. Not one. There is one where there was a human burial found, but that was turned out to be an extrusive burial. It was, it was made long after the pyramid had been built and long after the society that created it had vanished. But there have been no original burials in any of the pyramids of Egypt, from the largest to the smallest. That ought to tell you something. That is the, the textbook explanations of these things, which are still insisting that the Great Pyramid was made for a king by the name of Khufu, is completely erroneous, totally wrong. Whereas the Great Pyramid here in America, Monk's Mound, is almost virtually ignored, totally ignored, even though there's a magnificent museum associated with it. But how many of our listeners are aware of this fabulous construction effort that took place in the heartland of North America? And yet that story is uh, not discussed. And, And the reason why is it brings up too many embarrassing questions. For example, the Native Americans who live in the area among the, the Mohawk, claim that their ancestors did not build it. They were maybe associated with it, but a foreign people came in and raised it. Oh, that's, see, that smacks of scientific heresy, so we won't go into that. We won't get into that. But I will. I get into that, and I write up. That's the sort of thing that I write about. It really is hard to imagine that on a daily, on a daily basis, people out there drive right by that thing and probably never give it a thought. Ten stories tall thereabouts, and with a footprint bigger than the uh, the Great Pyramid in Egypt. Wow. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And it was all covered Things with... Things that made... Uh, one of, it was all, go ahead. It was all covered with what? A hardened clay. 
and this clay was painted with geometric designs so it would appear mostly spirals and solar designs and things like that and it was a magnificent thing to see and it was a temple on top which no longer exists it's a magnificent structure it still is even as a ruin it's fabulous wow somebody really worked on that thing yeah, absolutely Frank, we're going to take our break, and uh, we'll pick it up on the other side. If you're just joining us, Frank Joseph is our guest this evening. We're talking about his new book, Before Atlantis, published by Bear and Company, and the book's available on Amazon.com in print and in Kindle format. And we'll be back in about two minutes. Okay, we are back. If you're just joining us, Frank Joseph is our guest this evening. We're talking about his uh, eye popper of a book, Before Atlantis. If you like history, you like ancient, ancient history, uh, this one, you'll have a lot of fun with this one. Okay, Frank, um, with 20 million years of human and pre human culture before Atlantis to talk about, where would you like to begin? You want to start talking about Atlantis or, or just go back to that enormous. Uh, uh, Toba supervolcano in Indonesia. Where, where, how would you like to start? Well, what I wanted to do with this book is I wanted to at least address a couple of questions. And those questions were, what makes human beings so different than all other animals? And we are. We're totally different. We're related to all the mammals and life on this planet, but we are so unique some may say we're unique because we alone create civilization. We also have the capacity for godlike achievement. Our science, our culture on the one hand, and just individual human compassion are really godlike qualities. And yet we're the same species that are capable of enormous satanic destruction, cruelty. There's no animal on the planet as cruel as we are. So I wanted to find out why. What is that? What has made us so different? And the other question was, why is it that every civilization that we make goes through the same patterns of birth, youth, maturity, decline, and death? Each one, from the Sumerian civilization all the way on up into the Soviet Union and our own, we all go through these same patterns. Why is that? Why can't we hold on to it? And I figured that the only way that we might be able to get some kind of a handle on these questions is to have a broad overview of where we came from, how, where we really originated from, and to look at our story, just like if you look at an individual human being. You can't understand that individual, why he does these things, unless you know his past, everything that led up to a particular moment in time that you're investigating. So that basically is is the broad view that I'm trying to take in Before Atlantis. I call it Before Atlantis because I wanted to give the reader an idea that we're looking back a very long time ago. And one of the things that I found out in the story of evolution is the, the time parameters are expanding all the time. I can tell you that I've written really most of that book, most of Before Atlantis, by the information that I found on the Internet. And that's because there are these terrific discoveries that are being made at an exponential pace. They're, they're coming out so fast and furious, it's very difficult for people to, to appreciate them, to even to know about them. Unfortunately, the news media pays them very little attention because these tremendous discoveries that are coming out so quickly that as the pace of technology begins to increase, that our, our concept of the past is really altering more radically than we've ever seen before. For example, we're told that human beings, proto-human beings, really began about two million years ago. Even that's really quite a stretch because not too long ago we thought it was only half as long, but a million years ago. Now we know, we can definitely trace back that there are the origins of human beings about two million years ago. But now we're seeing that there are indications of human beings that existed long before them long before two million years ago, and that these humans who lived before two million years ago also had certain levels of technology. And that it's, it's amazing that this information is, has come out and is really changing our concept of our origin. And I found out that what happened to us a long time ago, let's take that two million year beginning, because that's what still most... Uh, evolution.
creationists are holding to, even though they know that our origins are earlier than that. But the consensus right now is about human beings are about 2 million years old as a species. And what happened was this. We lived, our ancestors lived in the trees all the time. We were in the trees for a very long time. That's because the top of the trees was very safe. The environment was supportive. We had lots of fruit to eat. We were very peaceful, docile primates, lived in the trees, kind of like orangutans in a way. And then something happened with the environment. The environment started to change radically, so much so that desert conditions began to prevail and life in the trees was no longer possible. And so our ancestors were forced to leave the trees and were on the ground, which was a very dangerous place filled with predators who were bigger and stronger and more violent than we were. We had had to change our diet from strictly vegetarian or fruit eaters to now we were scavengers. We became meat eaters. We had to become meat eaters. There wasn't anything else to eat, really. We became competitors. And this story is pretty much the same as what happened to baboons and chimpanzees and other our fellow primates. But what happened to us, I found out, is something that is unique. We were challenged after we got to a terrestrial environment by another major change in the environment, and this was the encroachment of water on a large scale flooding. We're talking about pre-human populations in East Africa. And about 1,700,000 years ago, there was major flooding that took place that created a numbers of little islands, shrinking environments. And our ancestors were forced to confront a situation in which they were had to either adapt to these new situations or perish. And many species do perish when confronted by such a major environmental change. And our ancestors began to adapt to an aquatic existence on the, the, the lake shore, as it were, or possibly a sea, we're not sure, but on a watery shore. And over time, we began to develop mammalian traits. And some of those mammalian traits are, those, those sea mammal traits are still with us today. And I'll talk about those later. And so we were in the process of going through a change that the dolphin went through. The, or, the earliest ancestor of the dolphin was a dog-like animal. It was completely terrestrial. It too was forced by a major aquatic change. And it went all the way and became a sea mammal, a dolphin. We were on that same track. And I can hear now the music telling me that we'll have to swim to into the you're, next section. You're a, ve- you're a veteran of these programs, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've done quite a few of them. You've got some interesting photos in your uh, in your book. Plate number one shows uh, two infants. Uh, and the caption is, Natural born swimmer is a testimony to the aquatic phase that shaped our evolution. These two kids look like they belong there. And then another one, photo run right underneath shows a small child with uh, some webbed fingers. Hmm. Reminiscent, remnant from our aquatic past. Things that make you go, hmm. We'll be right back in about three minutes with more conversation with Frank Joseph and his book, Before Atlantis. Okay, we are back, and we are going way, way back tonight with Frank Joseph. He's our guest this evening. We're talking about his new book, Before Atlantis, 20 Million Years of Human and Pre-Evolution, Pre-Human Cultures. Frank, on the other side of the break, you meant you were talking, you just touched on this uh, aquatic uh, aspect of human beings. Um, can we segue into a little bit of a conversation about the aquatic ape theory that came out in 1960, I think it was? Well, that's what I'm talking about, as a matter of fact. It's yeah. called the aquatic ape theory or the aquatic ape hypothesis. And actually, it is one of the oldest and most perennial of all scientific hypotheses because it was first proposed by the uh, founder of modern science, Anaximander, who lived about uh, four or 500 B.C. in ancient Athens. He suggested that all life, and especially human life, came out of the sea. It was taken up by a German uh, biologist in the early part of the 20th century, Max Westenhofer, and then was promoted during the 1950s and 60s by Alice, by a, uh, a British uh, scientist and then was most popularly known in the 1980s by Elaine Morgan, a science writer. 
So the theory really it only got to be known publicly, I guess, mostly in the 1980s, thanks especially to Lane Morgan. The mainstream scientists have found a lot to disagree with her about, but since she stated that and so so succinctly uh, made it uh, available to uh, ordinary folks like ourselves, a lot of confirming evidence has come out, and that's what I wanted to why I wanted to address this theory again because of all the confirming evidence that now has become available. Um, just to, to back up on the aquatic ape theory, make it as, as succinct as I possibly can myself. Uh, during this first aquatic phase that human beings went through, or proto-human beings went through, a very important thing happened. When you go into the water, you're, the center of gravity shifts because of buoyancy. And this made it possible then for these primates, these early proto-human primates, to stand upright. Then while the water retreated and these apes went back to their terrestrial existence, they found that they had been able, they now were able to stand upright, and this was the beginning of Homo erectus. Now, I'm really simplifying this, admittedly. I'm going as quickly as I can. We don't have enough time to go over all the details mm-hmm. that I enumerate in the book. But um, my only contribution to this theory, if it is, I don't know, maybe others have mentioned it as well, is that I believe that our ancestors, our pre-human and early human ancestors, went through several aquatic phases. And that at each time we went through an aquatic phase, there was more and more of the sea mammal that was left in us. We're, I believe that we are the result of this alternating or oscillating uh, series of phases between living on the land and making the best we can, and then encroachment by water, and we're in, enticed back to make another watery existence. The dolphins made a complete commitment to living in the sea. We did not. We went back and forth. And I think that it is this hybrid existence in ourselves, this hybrid creature that is modern man, that accounts for both our uh, compassion and our positive nature and also for our destructive negative nature. If you look at uh, our fellow primates, they're they're rather nasty animals. Chimpanzees are uh, they're yes. loyal only to their tribe, to their immediate surroundings. They, their capacity for uh, cruelty amongst themselves is bad enough, but against others who live outside the tribe is is extreme. Uh, the idea of the killer chimp is, is no myth. Well, then if you take a, another animal that we are related to, say the dolphin, then you have something which is, is not as an aggressive a creature. Uh, it is more of a, a compassionate animal. I'm thinking especially of the numerous instances of human beings who are lost at sea and drowning at sea that have been saved by wild dolphins. Stories like this have been repeated for thousands of years. So I think that we are, to, in a nutshell, modern man. Modern man is a combination, is a hybrid of the compassionate and quick-witted uh, sea mammal uh, who has left its traits in us, our ongoing traits, and also a combination of the killer chimp that, uh, that is capable of uh, cruelty and destruction. And that perhaps you know, uh, explains uh, our dual nature. You know, Frank, I never really connected the dots between dolphins and dogs until I was going through your book. You know, in in a very unusual way, they they you know, for all the cruelty we inflict on both of them, when we're in trouble, boy, they're always there. You know, or they're there often. We should put it that way. They're there often. There have been many many people who have been distressed and drowning at sea have been saved by dolphins. But I don't believe there. If there is a single case, it would be an extreme, unusual, untypical case of any human being that was saved by a chimpanzee or a or another ape. Usually, when an animal, a terrestrial animal, is in trouble, uh, it becomes a victim, immediate victim. That's just the nature of of life on land, and uh, it is the nature of life in the sea as well. But not amongst some of the sea mammals, where there are levels of natural compassion going on. So. It's a theory, admittedly. I'm not wedded to it, uh, but I think it helps to explain uh, our troubled uh, hybrid nature. It's a kind way of putting it. <laughs> okay, example, so... Uh, we have, just as, as a parenthetical on that, to back that up a little bit, rather than just leave our listeners hanging with that, uh, our numerous uh, sea mammalian traits are still with us today. For example, every human being is born with a set of gills in their neck. Isn't that incredible? When I read that, I was really surprised uh, that these, this trait um, disappears as the, 
the fetus develops. Uh, I've learned that between 7 and 9% of all human beings are born with webbed fingers and toes. Now, these traits, the webbed toes and fingers and the gills, do not appear amongst our fellow primates, They're only in human beings. We also have something called subcutaneous fat, or the ability to um, have blubber. We have blubber that surrounds our skin. That does not take place. You do not have subcutaneous fat on chimpanzees or apes. They do have some, very little, and that's to, to guard against, uh, to help guard some of their viscera. But we are able to put on substantial amounts of blubber and subcutaneous fat. And those populations, those human populations, that live close to the sea and interact with the sea a lot, put on lots of subcutaneous fat. I'm thinking like the Hawaiian population, for example. Mm -hmm. We are able to cry tears. No primate is able to cry tears. Yet crying tears is a mammalian trait to get rid of the salt out of our eyes, out of our eye ducts. A woman's hair, when she is uh, having a pregnancy, will grow longer and thicker, just as uh, a sea mammalian uh, mothers do. It's interesting. Something to think about, anyway. It is very, very interesting. Things that make you go, hmm, that's for sure. Uh, we're going to take our break, and on the other side, uh, perhaps we can drift into, uh, after, after we went through several of these aquatic periods, where did we go from there? So uh, let's pick it up from there. On the other side, we're talking to Frank Joseph tonight about his uh, intriguing book called Before Atlantis, 20 Million Years of Human and Pre-Human Cultures. And we'll be right back in about uh, three minutes. Okay, we are back. We're rolling into our last segment of the first hour with our friend Frank Joseph. We're talking about his uh, intriguing, fascinating book, Before Atlantis, 20 Million Years of Human and Pre-Human Cultures. Frank, before we leave the topic of the uh, uh, aquatic ape theory, you have a fascinating uh, little section here about elephants and how that fits into the aquatic ape theory. Right. This is one of the newest pieces of information that's just come out, matter of fact, uh, just about a year ago. It turns out that the elephant is also uh, like a fellow creature who's followed in the same evolutionary line as we did. In other words, the earliest ancestors of the elephants were completely terrestrial. They had no trunks, nothing of that kind at all. The watery environment encroached upon or rather, the uh, water encroached upon their terrestrial environment, and they, too, were forced to make a change, a challenge. They were challenged to adapt to these situations or perish, and they developed things like the trunk. They developed also the ability to swim. Then when the water retreated, instead of going on the, the same path followed by the dolphins and becoming a complete sea mammal, they returned to the land and brought with them these aquatic traits. Uh, most people are unaware of the tremendous swing, swimming abilities of elephants. Uh, elephants have been known to swim over, over 300, across 300 miles of open water, for example. So what excellent swimmers they are. They use water in a very creative way. And uh, it, it, they're really very parallel to uh, our own um, evolutionary path, which was from the land to the water, back to the land again several times. And their bodies are mostly hairless. And they that's have right. that they, subcutaneous layer of fat? That's right. They also have the subcutaneous layer of fat, and they've also become hairless. We are not hairless. Uh, we have as uh, many hairs as the chimpanzee. And the, the only difference is, is that our hairs have become much finer. But what is interesting about our hair patterns, totally unlike the chimpanzee or any other primate, is that the, the hair that goes along from the top of our heads all over our bodies follows water courses in other words, if you were to dump water uh, over somebody, the water would travel over the, wa the tracks of the hair identically to sea mammals, but completely, totally different than any of our primates. Uh, you were raising an interesting question, Scott, just before the last break, and that is, uh, what became of us after we began having all these oscillations between the land and the water? Well, it would seem that a little less than a million years ago, Homo sapiens, in other words, basically modern human beings, arose. But there were many variations of Homo sapiens, and these variations came and went, and they came into existence, and then 
faded out of existence, and we were pretty much on a kind of a a merry-go-round, an evolutionary merry-go-round. We were not really developing very much. True, we had we're, we had the use of fire, but we did not invent fire. We would pick up burning embers and so forth, and we would use it, but we didn't know how to invent it or really use it beyond that. And until about 75,000 years ago, which is not that too long ago, there were about 2 million human beings, Homo sapiens, and many variations of them around the world. That was our world population, about 2 million. We know that through DNA research. And then something happened 75,000 years ago. The largest volcanic eruption in Earth's history, known Earth's history, is called Mount Toba in Indonesia. And when this volcano erupted, it ejected so much material into the atmosphere that it wiped out whole animal and plant species. And ours was taken right to the brink. What happened was is that our human population of 2 million was reduced literally overnight to about 1,000 breeding pairs and a maximum of 20,000 survivors, probably much less than that. Could have been like three or 4,000 survivors altogether. Again, we know this through DNA studies, which when they first came out were highly criticized and, and not particularly believed, but uh, over the course of time, and refined DNA research, it's been established that we did go through a bottleneck, as referred to, a genetic bottleneck. Now, that was, in its time, the worst Holocaust that we'd gone through. But it was the greatest thing that ever happened to us because the survivors of Mount Toba had an increased immune system, and they had to be the toughest, the strongest, the smartest of of them all. Otherwise, they would not have survived. And they carried down those survival traits into you and me and every human being on the earth since that time. And this has been carried through in our quick-witted adaptability and our improved immunity system. That is the real birth of modern man. Homo sapiens sapiens is what survived and which, which arose 75,000 years ago. So that's our real pedigree before 75,000 years ago, uh, we weren't really much to look at, but we began, we began to become the dominant species only 75,000 years ago because our survivors were the toughest and the smartest. And that's what made human beings what they are. And that really helps to answer uh, the second question that I posed, is what made us so different? What, how are we able to create civilization when the other animals aren't able to do that? And I think that that great challenge that we met, even though it wiped out almost all of us and took it right to the razor's edge of extinction, was really the defining moment for us. And so when catastrophes like this have happened since that time, and will like definitely happen again in the future, we are to regard these things as really beneficial in the long run, even though they're very hard for us as a species to survive and go through. And I think that is what has made us what we are is that we have been able to adapt to these really horrific events. And uh, that's that's our singular identification, I think. Frank, this afternoon, I, when I was researching for, uh, for your visit this evening, I came across a fascinating graphic about the uh, that volcano, at, uh, uh, the uh, Toba supervolcano in Indonesia. And uh, it's a little graph I found. And basically what it did, what it does is it, it's, it, it's got some comparisons here. And if Mount St. Helens was a one, the Toba Super Volcano in Indonesia would have been rated at 2,800. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember when Mount St. Helens, you know, popped off and it was, it was quite an event. Uh, as a kid, I, for some, odd reason I was always interested in volcanoes. A lot of kids from, are. Yeah, probably from reading those stories in the, in the elementary school about uh, about uh, Pompeii and uh, Mount Vesuvius. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so when that happened, and I remember for a couple of years uh, after, in the early 80s, uh, we had spectacular sunsets. 
as a result of um, of all the um, uh, dirt that was thrown up into the atmosphere. But so if Mount St. Hel- Helens was a one, the Toba supervolcano was 2,800. And I also read that it created a volcanic winter that they estimated lasted between six and ten years and also initiated a 1,000-year-long cooling effect. That other big volcano, the one, the uh, Tambora uh, explosion in 1815 on this chart is rated at an 80 compared to Mount St. Helens. Compared you to mean Toba. Uh, right. Compared to compared to uh, the 2800 at Toba. I well, I'm really guy. grateful that you researched this and brought this out. Actually, I, I wasn't even aware of a lot of this myself. I put as many facts and figures as I can in the book, but there's really no way to grasp such an incredible natural disaster. But I think that you've helped to to make it more accessible in the in the mind's eye. But well, you know, uh, when I read it, I thought, oh, okay, a big volcano. You know, we've seen volcanoes. You know, so how big was it? And I saw this graphic. I went, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, it was it was pretty horrific. But I think that this not only answers how we made that transition from a rather dull homo sapiens into the super homo sapiens sapiens. But I think it also marks the beginning of civilization, organized society. Because in those days, immediately after this event, social interaction and social cooperation were absolutely necessary in order to survive. It was a matter of survival that you had to depend on your fellow creatures. And from this cooperation, this intensive cooperation arose civilization because civilization cannot exist without the cooperation of its residents, of its members. So we are told in their textbooks that human civilization began, oh, about 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia between the Tigris and Euphrates River in that valley there. I don't believe that at all. I think our civilization is 70,000 years older, and there's indications of surviving civilized societies that were around not shortly after that time, not too much longer after that time. And I think that that's what we're looking at. And the origin of civilization, I believe, was in Indonesia, was in the Pacific. That seems kind of hard to believe because this was the site for Mount Toba going up. Wouldn't that have killed everybody there? No, as it turns out, the radii or the radius of destruction was really far more profound beyond Mount Toba. The same thing with an atomic bomb. Interestingly enough, when the atomic bombs were dropped over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, the people that were directly underneath the blast survived, amazingly. And it was only the outward force of the explosion that did all the carnage and damage. I think there's an equivalency with Mount Toba. I'm certain that the Mount Toba explosion also must have created the mother of all tsunamis uh, all throughout the, uh, the Pacific. Absolutely. Big rim. So, you start to think of this stuff, and uh, you know, the more you're, you're happy you weren't there. So, Frank, we're at the top of the hour. We have our music playing, so we're going to take our top of the hour break. And uh, on the other side, we can pick it up from there. Frank Joseph is with us this evening. We're talking about his... Uh, fun book titled Before Atlantis, 20 Million Years of Human and Pre-Human Cultures, available at Amazon.com in print and in Kindle format, so go check it out. And if you like what you're hearing here on Far Out Radio, go to FarOutRadio.com and sign up for our free daily updates. That way you'll always know who's going to be on the program. Be right back. <laughs> 